research work regarding the specifications and requirements for uh, grid farming filters and microgrid applications. And, yeah. All right. As an outline for today's presentation, I'll first talk about the potential water instability in a weak distribution grid. And then I'll talk about the comparison of one current controlled approach and uh, another voltage controlled grid forming approach in mitigating the instability that was identified. And then I'll, um, the last part of my presentation will be on the performance requirements for grid forming and reducing microgrid applications. So, the first part, like I just mentioned, is about inverter instability and weak distribution grid. And this will be some highlights from our EPRI's um, work in the last two years. And here I've also provided links to our uh, free to public reports that you can look at if you're interested in the details. So as we all know that the power system is transforming from a traditional central fuel um, generation based power system into a more renewable penetrated system. And this is happening not just in transmission system, but also in distribution as well, as we have more and more centralized fuel based synchronous machines being replaced by water based resources, both wind and solar in the transmission, as well as smaller scale, but larger in number TV and wind penetration, also storage in the distribution system. Because of this, um, the electrical distance between an IBR, an inverter-based resource, and a voltage source in the system is increased. And if you look at this simple representative diagram, which shows um, the IBR connected to a voltage source uh, with an impedance in between, we know that as the electrical distance is increasing, the impedance um, between this IPR and the voltage source is also increasing. And as a result, really the sensitivity of the IBR's terminal voltage with regard to its own current or power generation is increasing. And this high, higher sensitivity really cannot be, um, um, be taken well by the conventional design of IBR because as we know, the traditional design of IBR is for a stiff grid operation, which means it's uh, the voltage that it's measuring and adjusting to has to be stiff. But in this new paradigm where the voltage sensitivity, the, volt the terminal voltage is highly sensitive to its own current or power generation, in this scenario, the conventional design of PLL has some challenges. Um, but at the same time, I also want to note that this sort of challenge of operating a generation resource in weak grid is not unique to an IBR. Actually, even for synchronous machines, we have um, experienced the similar kinds of issue before. Um, for example, if we have different pockets of, or different numbers of uh, synchronous machines that's being connected through long tie lines, we can have unstable, unstable inter-area oscillations. And that was actually motivated the invention of power system st stabilizers in the 1990s. And we think similar approach can be utilized to actually stabilize the operation of IBRs in this weak grid scenario as well. Now, I also want to mention that there are other aspects in this weak area, in this weak grid notion, because to me, weak grid is actually a very high level term, which can include not only this high voltage sensitivity to current injection, but also it can have other meanings such as low short circuit low short circuit ratio or low short circuit capacity, or even this high rate of change of frequency, which is basically an indication of low inertia in the system. So all these can be features of weak grids in the system. 
As I mentioned, um, this big grid operation of IDR really brought, has brought about challenges uh, on the operation of IDR and system stability. And a lot of these challenges has been observed uh, in the transmission area. For example, here I show an example of Burkhat, where they have issues in operating this um, high wind penetration area, which is the panhandle area on the um, northwest region of Texas. And this has been one of the key drivers um, for looking into grid forming in water in the transmission system. Now, what we try, what we were trying to understand is whether similar challenges can occur um, also in the distribution grid. Now, for that, we want to first um, 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 look at how the uh, grid strength is evaluated in the distribution grids. Now, as we all know, that a uh, uh, very high level index has been commonly used to evaluate the grid strength, uh, which is the Shaw circuit ratio. In the context of power distribution systems, the Shaw circuit ratio can be evaluated basically at two locations. Um, the first one is to evaluate the Shaw circuit ratio at the PCC of an IBR, uh, which is the point of common coupling. And this can be simply defined as the Shaw circuit capacity at that point over the nominal power rating of the IBR uh, plant that we are looking at. Now, the second way to define this short circuit ratio is at the substation. So for this one, we'll look at um, the short circuit capacity at the substation over the aggregated power rating of the IBRs. So in case you have different, you have more um, IBRs penetration on that feeder, um, the aggregated impact of all the IBR penetrations on the feeder will be to reduce the short circuit ratio at the substation. Um, as of today, it is very common that for distribution grid, the short circuit ratio at the, at the substation is maintained high enough by the transmission and sub-transmission system. But as we know, when there are uh, a lot more synchronous machines getting retired in the transmission system and a lot more penetration, um, IBR penetration in the distribution systems. The um, um, short circuit ratio at the substation can um, be decreased, which means um, the IBRs connected to power distribution system will then be exposed to this weak grid operation as well. So to really look at whether inverter instability and challenges to inverter operation can occur in distribution system when the um, short circuit ratio at the substation is reduced. So we set up this uh, example uh, simulation study where we look at two distribution feeders and they are identical. Um, they're connected to a um, distribution substation, and then the substation is connected to a transmission system as an equivalent feminine, uh, feminine equivalent uh, voltage source. Now we look at two scenarios. The first one is um, with an SCR of 50, which is representative of um, the situation today. And we also look at another case where the SCR is reduced to five which we predict um, that could potentially be the case in the future uh, when the grid becomes weaker. Um, and the disturbance that we consider in this study is that we apply a voltage sag to this voltage source, which represents the transmission system with 55% remaining voltage for 0.1 second. So this basically simulates the influence of a uh, fault happens in the transmission system on the distribution feeder. And if you look at each, um, each distribution feeder that's connected to the substation, um, it has three large scale or utility scale PV plants connected to different locations of the feeder. Um, and the total capacity or, or the total um, active power capacity of the PV plants are 10 megawatt on each feeder 
and there are unbalanced loads on each feeder and the total load on each one is three megawatts. So this means there's significant amount of real power back feeding um, into the transmission system. So we also use this to um, study a, a little bit more futuristic scenario where you have a lot, uh, a lot of pen FDR penetration in the distribution and it end up back feeding a lot into the transmission. And as a base case simulations study, all the inverter controls in the distribution system, um, they are um, complying to 1547-2018, which is the most up-to-date standard in the distribution area for DR interconnections. And they are, um, they are operating with VOTVAR control, which has the 1547-2018 category B default settings. <laughs> So for this base case study, as we can see that after the fault occurs at two seconds, if you look at the SCR equals 50 case, which is rel relatively high grid strength at the substation. So in this scenario, all the inverters inside the distribution system manage to ride through the fault and then recover to deliver the original amount of real uh, active and reactive power after the fault is cleared at 2.1 seconds. However, when the grid becomes weaker and when the SCR is now five, as we can clearly see the um, inverters, they fail to um, return to the uh, original steady state operation after the fault. So this indicates that um, when the distribution grid is becoming weaker, the inverters can become unstable and show this sort of um, oscillations in the power output as well as voltage. Um, and another thing to point out is that the inverter trip settings are not activated in these simulations because we want to observe the inverter behavior um, even you know, after the fault. Now, if the typical inverter protections or, or trip settings are uh, activated, then it, it is very likely that um, these inverters will not be able to even ride through the fault. They'll be um, either ceased to energize or trip during the fault um, duration. Now, if we want to understand what's causing this inverter instability in this, um, in this case, on a, on a high level, it is mainly because that the PLL um, in, uh, for a conventional grid following control, which is what's being used in this case study, um, they are designed to work properly only when the grid voltage is insensitive to inverter current injection. Um, as I mentioned in the, a couple of slides ago, um, a feature of weak grid operation is that the inverter terminal voltage is now very sensitive to its current injection. And the conventional PL design simply will not be able to manage that. Now, um, notice here I mentioned most present day inverters. So this doesn't apply to all present day inverters because there have been inverters that are designed specifically for weak grid operation, which can operate with you know, weak uh, grid strength down to even below one or 0.5. So those um, inverters will not be, uh, which are not common today, especially in the distribution system are not included here. Now in the low short circuit system, what happens in this scenario is the PLL after this transient um, um, event, it fails to lock on to the grid frequency following the disturbance. And we had a paper elaborating on this um, mechanism to explain why this happens. I will not go into detail, but on a high level is because of the transient instability of the PIL in this weak grid operation. Um, okay, now we have, um, we have shown that um, this inverter instability can happen in weak distribution grid as well. Now, what are the methods to um, overcome this or to mitigate this instability? 
on, on that regard, uh, we have investigated two types of methods um, to uh, uh, improve this inverter stability. And on this slide, I just wanna show conceptually what are the possible methods that, can, that we can do to improve the IBR control such that it can become more stable in this scenario. So the first one is that um, we can reimagine the IBR control to have a um, voltage source type of behavior instead of a current source type of behavior, right? So this is commonly um, being discussed in the literature. Um, and I think we are, most of us are familiar with this type of control where you vary the output voltage of the inverter as a function of its um, real and reactive power generation or as a function of voltage and active power generation. And the inverter only controls its current when it hits the limit. Now, another way that we can potentially um, improve this inverter control such that it can be more stable in this weak grid um, scenario and this one is also less discussed in the, um, in the literature, which is to still use the current controlled method as of what's, what's being used today. But in this case, instead of keeping a constant real and reactive power reference, or instead of keeping these references to be varying in a slow manner, we try to change these references fast enough and properly such that the current output of this IBR can be controlled in a way that can stabilize the system. Now, these are just very high level descriptions of the um, two um, potential ways to improve the, the stability. And there are of course many important nuances involved. So, Another uh, thing that I want to point out here is that these ways to um, improve or reimagine the inverter control, um, they, they are purposed to deal with this high voltage to current sensitivity issue that's been brought about by weak grid operation. Now, there are, like I mentioned before, there are other aspects of weak grid operation, including low short circuit capacity, which is not something that can be fixed by inverter, just by inverter control, because it means that the IBR needs to contribute more fault current, um, which basically will require some improvement in the hardware um, besides control. Now, this, this control that I discussed can also help with this um, high rate of change of frequency because if we let the ABR, ABR to contribute um, to fast frequency response, it can certainly help with this uh, high rate of change of frequency or the issues that's brought about by low in, lowering, uh, lower inertia in the power system. Okay, if we look at the several grid forming controls that's been proposed in the literature, we can see that they fall into those two categories that I just um, described. The very common, and uh, I should not say common, the very popular, very popular and um, the ones that has been discussed a lot include the virtual synchronous machine control, the matching control, and the droop-based control, as well as the uh, voltage oscillator control. So these ones falls into the category where you control the inverter as a voltage source and vary that voltage magnitude and angle based on its active reactive power output. Um, I think just, just for simplicity, we can look at this droop-based control where we can clearly see that the input to the control is the active and reactive power uh, measurement, whereas the output from the control are the voltage and frequency signal. Um, and then these signals are generated by the inverter. Um, another type of reforming control that's been proposed um, and actually was originally proposed by EPRI um, 
and also this one is less discussed, is to still keep the um, current controlled um, method as the inner control loop. And on the outer loop side, we still measure the frequency and voltage from the external grid and rapidly or um, um, rapidly change the frequency and voltage reference um, to, uh, um, sorry, rapidly change the active reactive power uh, reference to generate a uh, current signal, and then the current signal goes through in a current control loop to generate the voltage that's being uh, produced by the inverter. So um, now we know there are different types of reforming control that may potentially improve this um, uh, weak grid operation issues of IDR in distribution system. Now we want to use this example case study to illustrate and compare their performance in mitigating this instability issue that we have observed. So this conventional inverter control with slow volt bar is what uh, we have been used in the base case. Um, so use of this control was pre previously shown to be unstable with a low SCR at the distribution substation. Now the two types of um, grid forming control that we want to compare is between this first one, joule based control, and the second one is motor control with fast reactive current injection. Note here we label it as dynamic voltage support. And if we compare this one with the original or conventional inverter control with slow volt bar, we can see the only difference is in this red circled area, where in conventional system, you measure the terminal voltage, it goes through a very slow volt bar control to generate the reactive power reference. So as, um, as context, the default open loop response time for volt bar is five second, and the fastest that you, that's allowed in 1547 is one second. So as we can see, it's quite slow compared to the inner control loops of the, of the inverter. So, um, and the one that we term as dynamic voltage support um, is, the difference is that now we directly measure the voltage and compare it with a reference and then use this voltage control, which is basically a PI controller to generate this Q axis current reference. And this control, as we can see, can be made much faster than this book bar. Now, if we um, rerun the same simul simulation, but in this case, we replace two of the IBR controls from the original or conventional 1547-based control to this dynamic voltage support or this group based control. Uh, I, and we want to observe the differences, right? So um, bear in mind that we only replace um, two out of the six PV um, uh, IBRs in this system. Now with the new, um, new type or with the improved IBR control technique, we can clearly see that with either droop control or dynamic voltage support control, um, the system can be stabilized to ride through the fault. And this stabilizing effect is not, not only applies to the two IBRs that is now utilizing these improved controls, but it, also, it actually applies to all six IBRs on the feeder, which means by utilizing grid forming control for two out of the six plans, it managed to stabilize the two, um, two feeders and other IBRs on, the, on those two feeders. Um, one thing that is interesting to notice is that even though the inverter control logic is very different for the two grid forming control approaches, that we tested here, we can see that both of them can stabilize the inverter following the fault right through. Um, and another important aspect to observe is that if you look at the reactive power response during the fault, um, for the conventional control, because the volt bar is 
pretty pretty slow. It doesn't change its reactive power output much during the fault. But with either dupe control or dynamic voltage support, as we can clearly see, the reactive power increases very fast um, right at the beginning of the fault, and it maintains at a high level during the fault. And this fast reactive power response helps to improve not only the um, voltage level during the fault, but also the stability um, um, of the IDRs on the two feeders. So these set of studies really um, give us very promising results that instead of, instead of developing a requirement that um, looking at the control techniques that to be used for grid forming, we can probably develop some system performance requirements. Like in this case, it would be fast grid power response. Um, as the requirements for grid forming to enable this weak grid operation or even islanded operation. Okay, so on the next two slide, I will divert just a little bit and talk about um, the results on small signal stability analysis of this current controlled um, grid forming inverter. So the reason that I want to do that is um, like I mentioned, this current controlled grid forming is really not uh, broadly discussed in the academia. And I know a lot of you may already have this question that how come a PLL based you know, current controlled inverter can still work um, in a weak grid or even in an island big grid, like I just mentioned. And to address that question, we look at small signal stability analysis of this particular type of control. And the ultimate goal is to explain why this type of control can still operate um, in, in an islanded grid. Now, if we think about PLL, it's very commonly been termed as a measurement unit or a frequency tracking unit. And that is because um, conventionally it's, it's used in IBR that's connected to a steep system, which means um, the, um, the use of PLL is mainly to measure the, the grid voltage and angle, and then the IBR can adjust its current or power accordingly. Now that current and power output will not change the um, grid voltage or angle because the grid is steep, right? So that's why we call it a measurement unit or a tracking unit. When it comes to weak grid, like I mentioned um, before, now the PLL angle will decide the direction or even the magnitude of the current output from the IBR. And now because the, the grid is getting weaker, that output of the IBR will again affect the grid voltage and angle, which will again affect um, the, the frequency of other devices in the system. Now, in this new context, I would rather call this PLL a synchronizing or synchronization mechanism rather than a simple measurement or um, tracking mechanism because the output of the result of this PLL now has an impact on the other devices in the system. And we commonly have this question, um, like if, it, if it's PLL and everything is tracking the grid, then what will happen when there's you know, no voltage source in the system or when there's no master, so to speak. But at the same time, we want to um, recognize that even for synchronous machines, we don't say there's a master in the transmission system and everyone has a swing equation and they follow each other to form a uniform um, frequency of the system. So following the same idea, we want to investigate why this PIL based approach can allow the synchronization um, of different IDR units in the island in grid. And to do that, we um, 
conducted the small signal stability um, of the PIL in weak grid. And we try to explain this mechanism by using this talk analysis. So as some of us know that this talk analysis is a very um, traditional approach. It has been applied for synchronous machine to understand um, inter-area oscillations and the um, damping that's brought about by um, the power system stabilizer, right? So here we apply the same approach and looking at IBR uh, in both weak grid scenario, which is shown on the um, this figure to the left. Also in the scenario where there's um, uh, the IBR is working in an island. So for each scenario, we establish the, the talk diagram or the talk, the talk analysis by um, um, looking at really focusing on this dynamics from the PLL, but we also considering the contribution from all other um, control loops in the IBR. Um, and the goal here is really to understand how this synchronizing talk and damping talks are formed and what are the key factors that affect these two talks. Um, the result of this study is that we show by proper design and tuning of the grid support functions, and both synchronizing and damping talk of this PLL dynamics can be positive, indicating there can be stable frequency response, of course, under small um, disturbances. Now, I want to recognize that these are preliminary results from our ongoing APRI research. And I also want to recognize the contribution from Thomas Joe, um, who's from Texas a &M University during his internship with APRI. Um, on this slide, uh, following the previous analytical analysis, we want to show some simulation demonstration um, you know, which can verify the analytical results. So for that, we um, run this simulation where the IBR is operated in an island condition uh, with current controlled approach and is based on PLL, like I just described. And as we can see from this simulation results, um, Okay, so this blue curve here shows the, um, um, the response where the load in the island is inductive. And the red curve here shows the response where the, um, the load is um, capacitive. Now the first disturbance here is by opening the switch to form an island with only one IBR. And the second disturbance here is a load step change. Now, as we can see with different parameter tunings, there, um, there could be a stable case, but of course, as for um, any control, as we, like we know, if you don't tune the parameters properly, the response can be unstable. And we use this, this set of results to show the feasibility of operating at this PIL-based um, current controlled inverter in an island, as well as to uh, verify the results from our damping talk analysis. So the key point that I want to highlight here is that um, even this PIL-based current controlled inverter can be grid forming, given that the outer loop controls are properly designed and tuned um, and I also want to mention that this conclusion is not just based on this uh, small scale systems. We also have um, simulation studies of larger scale IBR dominated system including transmission um, systems to show that these control can operate in a 100% renewable system. Okay, so if I conclude my first part of uh, presentation with just one sentence, I, I will say that we have showed it is very promising to develop performance requirements for grid forming inverters instead of um, particular technology-based definition.
Now that is really the basis for us to develop these performance requirements in microgrid applications. Now this is another um, set of work that EPRI has done in the um, past two years. And I also provide, again, provided the reference here um, for anyone who's interested to look at. So if you look at utility microgrid um, um, and its system level performance requirements. So I'll, I'll first introduce what a utility level microgrid is and uh, what I mean by it. So if you look at this figure here, where we have a feeder, a distribution feeder, actually two distribution feeders connected to a substation with a feeder tie line, which could be open or closed based on the feeder condition. And we know there could be single customer microgrid where a behind the meter facility, like a household or a hospital formed a microgrid by itself. And there could also be multiple customer microgrid um, and even feeder level microgrid where you have loads and generations connected at different feeder locations. And these microgrids involve at least part of the medium voltage feeder of the distribution and other utility owned equipment. So for this multi-customer microgrid and feeder level microgrid is what we call um, utility level microgrid because it involves utility medium voltage feeder and load generation at different locations. Um, now, one, one important thing to notice is that for a single customer microgrid, the power quality or the reliability of that small microgrid is not the concern of the utility operators. However, for these utility level microgrid, um, the utility operator has to make sure that the power quality and reliability are satisfactory for all customers that's connected to it. And for that, there must be some system level performance criteria established, such as the voltage on that feeder has to be maintained within a certain range um, and the same for frequency. Uh, I just wanna show one example microgrid project, which is happening um, in uh, national grid territory. In this particular microgrid project, um, the goal is to install a battery energy storage system um, at one of these five um, substations. And as we can see these uh, five substations, they are connected to um, the same sub-transmission line in a radial type of connection. So the goal here is that in, in case of a fault in the transmission system, the battery energy storage can sustain um, at least um, some of these substations and the distribution feeders connected to it. And the battery energy storage system specifications are um, 20 megawatt, 40 megawatt hour. And it also actually requires a short circuit current as high as 75 MVA, uh, short circuit level. Now, if you look at the reforming requirements um, that's being proposed in this example project, we can see that it requires some rather high level capability from the grid forming plant, including the black start capability, voltage and frequency regulation, the four quadrant operation capability, uh, sufficient fault current and phase balancing. So these requirements are pretty high level, um, which does not uh, gives all the details that a, a manufacturer could follow um, to, bid for, to bid for it. Um, and the reason is, is really the motivation of UNIFI, which is uh, an industry acceptable method of defining the functions and performance requirements for grid forming inverters and microgrid um, is presently lacking. So due to this, our utility partners um, or utility planners, they constantly face the challenge of defining these requirements by themselves. Now, why do we need 
detailed requirements of grid forming plants rather than those high level definitions. Um, this is um, to a large extent because of there is um, because of the significant interplay between a grid forming generation plant and other microgrid components. So in this figure here, I just show some aspects of this interaction. For example, the grid forming generation plant, its fault current level could um, affect the feeder protection design. And on the, on, on the other hand, the feeder protection design can dictate to some degree the requirement on grid forming generation plant. So when there is no detailed reforming requirements, we can imagine that it would require a lot of studies and testing to make sure that the system performance requirements are satisfied. Now, the goal of our research, which is to defining these detailed requirements for grid forming plants is to help um, um, to help to expedite the microgrid design because now the microgrid designer knows exactly what they will expect from a grid forming generation plant, right? And here I provide a list of what we have investigated, including um, the power and energy rating of the plant, the steady state voltage and frequency requirements, as well as some black star related requirements. And these aspects has been published in this report cited here. And there are also some other aspects that we are looking into this year and will be published um, at the end of 2022, which includes more of the dynamic and fault ride through type of requirements. Um, next, I'll just give one example on um, what uh, these requirements will look like. And I take the steady state voltage regulation or steady state voltage requirements as an example. So to come to uh, what we should require for uh, reforming inverter regarding this steady state requirements, I'll start from the macro grid system level steady state voltage requirements. Um, so as we know, the, the macro grid has to maintain its steady state voltage within a certain range just for power quality reasons. And the very commonly used um, range is the NCC84 range A, which is basically between 0.95 and 1.05 per unit voltage. Um, and of course, the, this voltage range can be designed a bit differently consider, considering the load characteristics in the microgrid, but um, this NCC84 range A is what's commonly being used. Now, another aspect regarding the steady state voltage is that if we have load imbalance in the microgrid, uh, which is common for, I'd say, almost all the microgrids, it can lead to some amount of voltage imbalance or imbalance. Um, even during normal steady state operations. So even if there's no single phase to ground fault, no unbalanced fault in the system, just because of the unbalanced load in the system, it can cause this um, voltage unbalance issues. Now this voltage unbalance will need to be restrained to prevent damage or derating to the three phase induction motor loads in the system. And we have different standards requiring different amount of um, different limits of this negative sequence voltage. For example, the NCC84 recommends that the maximum voltage unbalanced to be 3%. Um, now, what we want to understand is how we translate this system level performance requirements down to the requirements of um, the grid forming plant inside a microgrid. So to do that, we studied um, some real world microgrid circuit. And here is just um, introduction on the circuit that we used, um, which is uh, a part of the distribution feeder. So as we can see, here's the um, islanding switch and the substation is down here. Um, so when there's a um, outage in the transmission, um, the switch can be open and this single um, energy storage plant will then energize the remaining of the feeder as a microgrid. 
Um, okay, so we conducted this study in PSCOD. So we set up the EMT model for the grid forming emulator um, with both positive and negative sequence control. For positive sequence, we let it work at isochronous mode because it is the only plant um, inside the microgrid. And because this inverter is a three leg inverter, which is commonly used um, today, it has no grounding path to provide grounding to this microgrid. So that's the reason why we connected a grounding transformer at its um, PCC to um, provide grounding to the microgrid. So as a summary, we conducted three different case studies on the grid forming negative sequence voltage control uh, with um, look with different um, negative sequence control objectives. So for the first case, we consider that the, the grid forming emitter is not trying to regulate the unbalanced voltage in the system. And instead, it regulates the negative sequence current to zero, which means it doesn't want to do anything with negative sequence. It wants to give all the current capacity to its positive sequence. Um, for case two and three, we consider that the grid forming emitter is regulating the negative sequence voltage at its RPA. Um, so this RPA is the reference point of applicability, which is defined in 1547. In, in this case, for this particular plant is the PCC um, of, of that plant. Um, so the, um, for case two and three, the grid forming motor is trying to regulate the negative sequence voltage at its RPA to zero, but with different uh, negative sequence current capability. So this current capability is basically the limit that it, the control sets for its negative sequence current. So for case three, the maximum amount of negative sequence current can be produced is 0.05 per unit, whereas in case three is increased to 0.1. So we want to investigate how these different controls will affect the voltage imbalance in the system. And we did consider one disturbance in the system, which is at one second, we disconnect part of the, um, the feeder section just to simulate a low, low drop event in the grid, microgrid operation. Now, if you look at the results, um, sorry. So if you look at the results, in case one, where the um, grid forming plan is not regulating the voltage imbalance at all, we can see the voltage, the voltage difference between the three phases are quite large. And the shaded red area in this case indicates um, NCC84 range A limit, which is what we would like the feeder voltage to be within. But in this case, because it's not regulating um, the negative sequence voltage, the voltage is outside this, this voltage range that we want it to operate. And also the, the difference between the voltages on the three phases are significant. Now, when we go to case two and three, where the grid forming water is now capable of regulating the negative sequence voltage, we can see that because of that, the difference between the voltage on different phases are um, much smaller. Um, and if we compare case two and three, we can see with higher amount of negative sequence current capability, the control um, um, is able to bring the Voltage unbalanced even smaller with higher um, negative sequence current capability. And that is also verified by the results shown in this table below. So if you look at the highest feeder voltage unbalance per NC definition, we can see that when it's not regulating the negative sequence voltage, the uh, voltage unbalance goes up to 20% after the load drop. But in case two and three, it goes down. And in three, um, both before and after the low drop is within the 3% limit. So the um, conclusion from this study is that um, 
Based on it, we can identify that regulating negative sequence voltage is a key functionality um, that should be required for grid forming plant in the microgrid because if it's not required, there could be very severe voltage um, imbalance when the load imbalance in the system is significant. Now, um, we also recognize that to have effective negative sequence voltage regulation, it requires sufficient negative sequence current capability from the grid forming plant. And this amount of negative sequence, cap negative sequence current capability should also be required, but this number should not be universal because it depends on the loading of the microgrid and other characteristics. Um, just, just as an example, how what we need to consider um, for a steady state voltage requirement for grid forming plant and what it would look like um, if we put out this requirement for grid forming wood. So um, it would be something like this. A grid forming power plant should be able to regulate its RPA voltage to be within the NC range when the grid forming plant output is within its power and current capability. Now, as we all know, we should not require a plant to um, perform outside its power and current rating. And that is exactly why here, we only require this performance when the, its output is within its rating. But on the other hand, this implies that the power and current capability of the grid forming plant should be carefully selected or designed um, based on system studies um, of the peak load of the microgrid considering its in rush current and other aspects. Now, regarding negative sequence voltage and voltage balancing, a grid forming power plant should maintain balanced voltage or to maintain the voltage imbalance to be within a certain percentage at its RPA when it operates within the negative sequence current capability and total current capability. And there should be a requirement on negative sequence current capability. Um, and this requirement should be defined based on the microgrid loading condition and other possible contingency scenarios. With that, I think that concludes my presentation for today. And thank you. Um, and I think I'm ready for some questions and um, discussions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we, it's about four till the top of the hour. So that leaves about four minutes of officially guided uh, questioning. And then if you